we're very happy to have Tom Condon with us. Tom is a dear uh, friend and a mentor, and uh, it usually confuses people in the West when we say a brother, but it's, we don't usually use the word mentor, we use the word brother, and Tom is, an, uh, is, a, is a mentor and a brother and a dear, dear friend. And uh, uh, we to eat uh, before he's several times he's, he's delivered the uh, course for us before he has been here for the conference and uh, Tom was planned to come in April and a large group from those among us here was planned to attend the uh, courses with Tom unfortunately the situation didn't make it possible but uh, hopefully when everything settles and calms down and uh, things are better we will uh, Tom will be visiting us again we have plans right now for the second half of 2021, but things will be confirmed as, as life goes on, as the situation in the world goes on. Tom today will be talking to us about uh, the Enneagram, the virus, and the void of uncertainty. So uh, please uh, welcome Tom. We will have, uh, I mean, Tom will talk to us for a while, and then at the end we will have an open uh, Q&A where you can raise your, the blue hand of Zoom and we can have some discussions also at the end. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're very happy to have you all. And uh, please, Tom, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, I hope that things in Egypt are better than they are in America right now. I think they might be. <laughs> but. But um, it's nevertheless a chaotic time and a time of uncertainty and a time where we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And this sort of relates to the Enneagram and someone's awareness of their Enneagram style, it seems to me. Because people will talk sometimes about you know, transcending their Enneagram style, transcending their ego. But actually, you know, it's, an Enneagram style is more like an operating system. And some of it you need. And it, it actually serves a number of purposes that are useful and biologically inevitable. Um, one of them is it, it gives you a view of the world. It gives you a view of yourself within that. Um, maybe a grow and change and work on it. You realize the view of yourself was not the, the total picture and that you, as you work on yourself spiritually or psychologically or both, that you're, you, you, you sort of awaken from the, the dream of being only your self image. But also an Enneagram style encompasses a way to manage wounds. Uh, people will have a sense of uh, injury or have a sense of trauma in their background or maybe just uh, certain pressures that they grew up living with that are then kind of managed and protected in a way through your Enneagram style. Um, gives you a sense of control in that sense. It's sometimes an illusion of control, but uh, you know, if I'm a one and I tense my shoulders and I talk to myself in a certain way, that may feel like control in a historical sort of way, but actually it, it might be just a, a, a sort of adaptive strategy, a way in which I managed my insecurities or managed my uncertainties or managed my feelings. And an Enneagram style will also give you, you know, ways to fulfill a family role sometimes, or it, it doesn't give you that, but, it, but your family role uh, when you're growing up will come out through your Enneagram style. And as people work on their Enneagram style and work on their personality defenses, they start to realize, well, this, this is a role playing a role that I was expected to play, but maybe I want to have more choices now. Maybe the role is uh, too confining or too constricting or designed to help me cope with my family of origin, 
but not necessarily with uh, life as I find it now in 2020. And then there's another way in which an Enneagram style protects, I think. And that is in relation to what in the West we would call the void. Um, I'm not really sure what the, the local word for that would be, but there's a point where people will come sort of to the edge of their map. You know, they've, uh, they've, they've lived in, they've had a map of reality and a, a map that has certain potentials and uh, a kind of inner way of seeing themselves and seeing the world. And then something new will come along that is startling or um, changes your, your perspective greatly or is, uh, introduces an element of uncertainty. It's almost like it opens up a, a further world. And in that opening up, it could be a phase someone goes through in life where they maybe get divorced or get married or have children or, uh, you know, go through a, maybe lose a job and not really be certain of what the, the next step is going to be. And then there's a spiritual version of that, which is the, the, uh, the kind of sense of expansion and the sense of uh, flow that people will have sometimes, where they're opening up to a larger reality that's beyond their personal self and beyond their personal concerns. And at least in the West, I'm not really sure how to integrate this with, um, with your culture, but at least in the West, the void is a kind of a tr an experience that is attractive to people and then also that they're afraid of at the same time. It's sort of like you, you want to ease your suffering, you want to open up and expand to what's beyond your personal self. And at the same time, there's a, a fearful quality to it, uh, sort of like you, it brings anxiety sometimes or uncertainty about uh, what will happen next. And a, a expansion that makes you feel smaller in one way, but then also sometimes more connected in another way. And it seems to me this is one element in Enneagram to consider, is that sometimes people are trying to both go beyond their personal self, and also at the same time are hesitating and, and pulling back. And when they hesitate and pull back, this is uh, the kind of anxiety that we are feeling nowadays with the, the virus and the various changes that it's requiring of us and the various uncertainties that it's kind of introduced in lives. And the, the, you know, the, the kind of complicated processes that we will have to learn in order to travel someplace or uh, just get around through daily life or work in an office, not work in an office. A lot of things that have become kind of uh, certain and, and unstable in a way. And this leads to anxiety, it leads to vulnerability, it leads to a kind of area within a, a person's psychology that they, maybe their Enneagram style has protected them from. And so, this is actually a, a, a good departure point for talking about the, the virus. The, you know, it exposes, the, the, the condition of it exposes rigidity and anxiety and points of vulnerability. And people cope with that in different ways. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, working with anxiety and working with vulnerability. Uh, especially in relation to an Enneagram style and what it does for you and kind of present a, a, some considerations, sort of a model uh, for you 
to think about. And it has five steps to it. And one of the steps is, begins with gathering information and kind of, uh, oh, you know, learning about what's going on in the world around you, but also observing yourself in the way that we talk about in Enneagram circles. Um, the, this, you know, strength, self observe beginning to notice uh, what triggers you, what, um, what triggers there are in this current situation that, that set off a, a vulnerable reaction or an anxious reaction, an uncertain reaction that you try to cope with in some way. Um, gathering information involves partially a realistic assessment of what the situation is. Over here, and probably in Egypt, we've um, there are still groups of people who really just deny the impact of the the virus, and who are not very well informed, and not uh, somehow interested in it. It's just a kind of a casual, distant, abstract thing for them. So they don't do things like wear masks or um, uh, socially distance or things like that. They're not. They're just not aware of it. And to a degree, to uh, to sometimes a considerable degree, they're in denial about the the impact of it and the contagiousness of it, which is you know really uh, really what's problematic about it. It's just amazingly contagious and. And yet, you, when you gather information or you go online and uh, read about the, the virus in various ways and the impact of it, there's a, a, a way in which that can trigger you. You know, you can, you can start to uh, react, start to get upset, start to uh, feel anxious, maybe somewhere in your body. And learning about or beginning to recognize what's triggering you is a helpful thing. Um, I'm a six, uh, it, so I'm an authority on this. And um, one of the things that I recognize is if I have too much information, then I might start to get anxious or uh, kind of depressed or kind of uh, upset in some way. And trying to then put it in perspective and gather information for a realistic assessment becomes sort of helpful. And also recognizing that maybe the, the triggering experience is based on oh, maybe overgeneralizing, thinking, oh, this is a total disaster or this will be a, a comprehensive mess or there will be you know, uh, terrible consequences, or also uh, speculating too much in a, a what if kind of way. This is something that sixes specialize in. Uh, what if this? What if that? What if that? What if that? And in doing that, you start to scare yourself. You start to create anxiety within your direct sensory experience. And this is, by the way, just so you know, the, the reason that if you know sixes and you try to talk them out of their fears, uh, it's impossible because their fears are always uh, are often based on what if. And so the fears are based on possibility, not probability. And so if you talk to somebody who is saying, well, you know, a plane could crash into my house, the and you you argue with them, you say, well, that's not going to happen. The the six will say, well, you don't know. It could happen in a random universe. So you can't really argue possibility uh, with yourself or with anybody else, but you can look for probability. What's realistic? What's likely? What's um, What do I know so far that can confirm or deny my my fears? 
So that's, that's sort of one step. Also, overgeneralizing is a factor in this as well, where somebody will say, well, it's always this way, or it's never that way, or it's always going to be this way in the future, and we'll never have this again, and we'll always have this in, uh, waiting for us. That's usually too sweeping. It's usually too much of a, a sort of a, a negative habit that a person might have in talking to themselves about the future. And the, the goal of talking about the future in that way is to have certainty. And what you then realize is, well, there, there is uncertainty. There's, there, there isn't certainty yet. This is an evolving story. This is a moving target. It's unclear what the long-term consequences are going to be. It's somewhat clear what the short-term consequences are. And then that, become, that, that kind of narrows the focus a little bit. And it kind of brings it down to uh, something more specific, something more objective, something more uh, based on facts rather than based on uh, exaggerated pictures in your mind's eye or talking to yourself in a way that's overly dramatic. Uh, those are things that you can have some control over, some, some choices about. And then uh, step number two in working this way has to do with uh, what I call going with. In other words, if you if you recognize that you have an anxious feeling or an uncertain feeling or a, 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 a sort of void of uncertainty within yourself, going with it means going into it and sort of admitting it and, and giving it, maybe uh, allowing yourself to feel it, giving it a, a sort of faith, giving it, giving it a sort of and. Um, maybe giving it a label and identifying what the what the tension is, uh, what the what the uncertainty is, and sometimes then you can go with a feeling of let's say anxiety and intensify it, and the, it it can be helpful to sort of give it expression and give it form rather than fighting it you know, rather than trying to you know kind of uh, recoil from it and and do something jump into action or jump into action, uh, uh, in a way that's not really well thought out so giving it form might be sort of breathing into it you know they we talk about it in enneagram circles in terms of presence you know, but um, but going into the feeling rather than fighting it means that you identify identify what it is, give it a label, uh, try to identify where it is in your body, uh, maybe use your imagination to take the anxiety and see it in a certain way, see it as a in a symbolic way, see it as a a picture in your mind's eye, and also maybe be aware of anything that you've been saying to yourself and you know sort of adding that into the picture and intensifying it for a little while and then uh giving it after after giving it expression and form then just kind of uh breathing into it and and just kind of you know tensing up your body uh uh, kind of intensifying it and then letting it go and letting it go is not uh, I don't mean that in a glib way you might have to do this several times where you you tense back up again and then you let it go you tense back up again and then you let it go but in doing that you're giving it expression and form and acknowledging the perfectly appropriate feelings this is a a time in history where you know things are things are happening on a big scale, and there there are dangers, and there are uh, things to. It's very confusing, and there are things to to worry about sometimes. 
but giving the worry expression, giving the, the, the fear some form is often a very useful step. You, you go into it and you, you, you kind of acknowledge it and kind of exhale it and maybe do it several times. And then step number three has more to do with presence as we talk about in Enneagram circles, um, meaning that you are, you, you bring yourself, uh, once you've, you sort of uh, have discharged some of the anxiety, you bring yourself into the present and bring yourself into your present awareness and look around the, your surroundings. Maybe first notice three things that you see and then three things that you hear and three things that you feel. And then notice two things that you see, two things that you hear and two things that you feel. And then one thing that you see, one thing that you hear, one thing that you feel. And also uh, it helps to concentrate on your body and to concentrate on, on bodily reactions rather than emotional reactions at that point. And maybe if you're a seven, for example, um, pay attention to how your feet are on the floor, that sort of thing. If you're, if you're a one or you're a, a six, you might notice how you're, you've tensed yourself and, and then add through that process I just mentioned, you know, have begun to relax your shoulders or uh, relax your, the, the feeling in your leg. The other thing that you can do with increasing the tension is kind of, um, is like pretending there's a coin between your legs and then squeezing them together. Uh, you know, as you're, you're holding the coin between your legs, between your knees, squeezing them together in a way that utilizes the largest muscles in your body. And that in particular helps with uh, dissipating some of the anxiety. But also, whatever you do already to kind of uh, increase your sense of presence, as, you know, whatever methods that you've learned, methods that you've used in, from working with the Enneagram or working with other, other modes of uh, uh, self-help uh, that is also a valuable thing to begin to pay attention to your immediate surroundings pay attention to your immediate sensations and then step four involves going to for if you're anxious it involves going to a safe place uh, sort of reminding yourself or calling up an experience in your life of a place that you really enjoy, a place that you, where you really felt safe, a place where you really felt like you were, uh, you know, uh, safe enough to relax, safe enough to, to relax and enjoy yourself. Uh, noticing, you know, kind of using your imagination maybe to, to fill in the surroundings, you know, there could be the the beauty of water and sunlight on water, or it could be trees, it could be like an oasis, or it could be something else, someplace else that's been particularly meaningful for you. And then in addition, this is where the Enneagram is really helpful, I think, because the, each Enneagram style has a high side. Each Enneagram style brings talents and resources and capacities that are present when you're at your best, that you can sometimes focus on and use as a, a, a guiding point, you know, something that you're, that you're orienting your attention towards and that you're allowing to come into your awareness. What's it like when I'm at my best as a, as a two, as a three, as a four? What's it like when I what, is, what, what would be a kind of representative sensory experience of that? And fill in some of the details, you know, add, add in things that you can see, maybe things that you can hear, 
um, the, the feeling that goes with it, maybe even tastes and smells, but also the Enneagram comes into it in, in this way because there's a connection from your central Enneagram style to a number of other Enneagram styles. You know, you, there are what they used to call stress and security points. Those all have a high side to them. Those all bring advantages. Those all have come up at various times in your awareness or in your behavior down through the years in ways that are constructive and helpful and bring a, a kind of aptitude or uh, talents or uh, a, a kind of perspective on things that can be really helpful. Also, um, people teach the subtypes in different ways, but it always seemed to me like each subtype has a uh, has strengths and talents and advantages that it brings, and people once they start to think about it, they realize, oh yeah, the you know, I, uh, I'm very self pres oriented, but I'm, I'm really able to handle details and the, you know, the business side of life and, and pay attention to the small things, the immediate things and, and give them their, uh, give them attention in some way that, that takes care of, uh, what's necessary and helpful, you know, with, with like, uh, feeding my children, feeding myself, uh, uh, making money or managing money, or uh, having a home that you that you stay in and maybe uh, improve in various ways. A, a kind of focus that the high side of self-preservation brings. There's also a a high side to uh, an intimate subtype a one-to-one -one subtype. They sometimes call it sexual, but I find that sort of misleading, actually. And the high side of that has to do with uh, friendship and close relationships and uh, connecting with others in a, in a very particular, singular way. You know, you're, you're different when you're with your best friend than you are with someone in a, uh, a market or something like that. And in your capacity for friendship, you can you can be able to oh, appreciate the people in your life for who they are without expecting them to be different, or have multi-level connections with them where you you have a, a a kind of deep, complicated connection with them that is very meaningful and satisfying to you. And if you're strong within the intimate subtype, and we have all of them, but if you're strong within that, uh, and that's much more emphasized in your relationships and in your behavior, then that capacity to make kind of deep singular connections is really there and really sort of available to you. And in the the current situation, it can take the form of reaching out to people that you haven't talked to in a long time, for example, or, and also expressing from your heart what, um, what you appreciate about a particular person that you're close to, things like that. And then with the social subtype, I mean, we're being encouraged not to be social in the sense of jo uh, going out in groups, and that's probably quite wise because the the virus is very contagious and and yet uh, a kind of social awareness about um, how we are all in this together and how we can you know think about ways to behave and ways to contribute that benefit not only ourselves but other people it may take the form of um, Oh, being kind to people in a, a new way, in a different way, you know, going out of your way to to do that, or uh, I don't know, giving someone who is uh, uh, who's had their income severely reduced 
maybe giving them a slightly larger tip than you might ordinarily do, things like that, or expressing your appreciation of uh, people who work in uh, stores, for example, or in uh, what they call essential businesses. Uh, we have restaurant takeaway over here, but uh, they've started to have people sit down in restaurants, but nobody wants to do it. But the uh, the state has said it's okay to do, but people are still staying out of restaurants, and they they but they do miss the food, and so they go and get takeaway. And uh, you know there are people who are uh, handing over the takeaway bags and maybe expressing appreciation towards them or giving them a tip or something like that uh, would be a good thing. I don't know, culturally, you know, I'm speaking as an American, obviously. So you have Enneagram-based strengths, uh, both in the subtypes and also in the, the your central Enneagram style that are good to sort of reflect on maybe to write down, to make, a, make some listings of these things, so that, and kind of underline them in your mind, but also allowing for the experience of, yeah, what's it like when I'm at my best? Or what's a, what do I really like about my Enneagram style? How do, I, how do I appreciate it? What does it give me? And then also the other connections, like wings, uh, stress and security points, so-called those all have a high side. There is a, a model of the Enneagram that got started a long time ago that was sort of a mistake that said with stress and security points that there was, there was a, one of them would come out when you were under stress and the other would come out when you were on holiday or when things were especially secure. But most of the people who have worked with the Enneagram for a long time um, I've been at it for 40 years, find that uh, those connections are mixed. And you may, under, under certain circumstances, go to the low side of your stress point, but you also have a high side. It also brings, again, talents and aptitudes and resources and strengths. And so those are nice to kind of underline in your mind as well, maybe write down maybe kind of try to take them on like you would put on a shawl or a, a shirt and and try to feel them from the inside out in order to remind yourself of what it's like when you're at your best and this is a time when you could use that i think and then and also that may include spiritual experiences that you've had uh, ways in which you feel connected to a larger reality, ways in which you feel uh, protected, ways in which you feel like you are um, sort of participating in a larger flow of life. That would go with the, the social subtype, but also it, it goes with uh, emphasizing your strengths, emphasizing what the Enneagram is pointing to you as uh, uh, the high side of these connections. And then that could translate uh, into step five, which is appropriate action. And that can take a lot of different forms in the, in the current situation with the pandemic. Uh, it means uh, maybe wearing a mask, uh, practicing social distancing, being careful and mindful of exchanges that you have with people. They, you know, they say that um, oh, two people sitting in a restaurant across from each other could be, uh, one could be infectious. And if they stay there for a while, uh, talking closely, maybe three feet away, one meter away, um, that the chances of infection of the, uh, the, the other person are, are higher. And thinking about, you know, uh, so being around people who talk loudly or talk expressively um, the, uh, or shout or uh, and don't wear masks, you know, maybe kind of uh, 
keeping your own distance rather than trying to get them to keep theirs. Also, the appropriate action means what's useful or what's immediate, what's uh, what's good to do, not only as a practice, but also maybe as a, a new skill to learn or ways in which to utilize the knowledge that you have of the current situation for uh, in order to protect yourself, protect others around you, and as well, um, kind of uh, keep going forward in a constructive way. And so those are all kind of considerations and that sort of model I just described and uh, to summarize it, and it involves maybe gathering information, kind of standing back from the situation, learning as much as you can about it, uh, standing back from your own reactions. You know, the, the big relief when people learn the Enneagram is they, uh, one benefit is they start, stop taking other people's behavior so personally. And also then they stop taking their own behavior so personally. They kind of begin to recognize their reactions, begin to recognize uh, being triggered, uh, maybe even beginning to recognize how they do this to themselves in the theater of their own mind. But also, um, it, it helps you be a little more objective about uh, some of the themes in your life and maybe even looking back on some of the relationships that you've had in your life and helps you start to realize how relative uh, uh, points of view of the world are. Uh, ways in which, you know, people with other Enneagram styles see, see things much differently and uh, they're very sincere about that. It's not some, they're not doing it just to annoy you. Um, that's probably, probably enough for the moment. Uh, I can't see anybody. I'm not real sure who I'm talking to. But uh, if people have questions or comments or feedback or um, things to share about ways Thank you, Tom, for answering all these questions. It's clear from the Q&A that there's a lot of energy coming out. There's, there's a lot kept inside and people are needing to share and getting out. But uh, unfortunately, we do have a, a limit and we don't want to exhaust you too much. But this has really been magnificent. We, we cannot thank you enough for, for all your sharing and your generosity and for being with us and we hope we see you again and again and one day we can see you live again with us in Cairo. Uh, thank I'm you really so much. Very glad to do this and thank you for having me and uh, we can do it again sometime. Thank you and I'd appreciate if ever, as many as possible to open your cameras. Let's have a big picture together and also open your mics and everyone say thank you and bye to Tom, it would be lovely. So just unmute yourself, open your cameras. Let's say thank you and let's have a big thank picture you. together. Thank you. Bye so bye. Tom. Thank, thank you. Tom. Thank, you. Tom. thank you. So generous thank of you, thanks so much. Tom, lovely to see you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Nice to meet thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much, everybody. Tom. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank you all. This has been Thank really you. lovely. Thank you, really. Thank you. Magnificent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Khaled. Dr. Khaled, you want a picture, you. please? Bye bye. If you can, if you can take bye. a picture, doctor. Bye bye. bye. Dr. Khaled. Thank you. Sorry, what did you say? Take a, picture. take a picture together. We want a picture together. Yes, you okay. Can make it. Everyone open the cameras. We'll take a yeah. picture. Smile. <laughs> more cameras. I want to fill the screen. Ah, two more people. No more? Okay, one more. That's it. One. Just a minute. Someone here. Just a minute. And one, two, and another one. And that's it. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Tom, so much.